All right, thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Thanks for coming. Thanks for organizing this. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, so this is my second Camp Phi. Uh, so I, oh, so my, my talk is about uh, retirement withdrawal strategies, obviously, right? And uh, the title is The Need for Precision in an Uncertain World. Sounds like a, sounds like a contradiction in and of itself, but I actually want to show you why I think otherwise. So anyways, I like uh, studying safe withdrawal uh, strategies. I, I always found that it was extremely easy to save money and accumulate money. As you set that on autopilot. Well, sometimes you save more, sometimes you save less. Don't really have to worry too much about that. You just keep saving uh, and uh, you can accumulate a lot of money over 5, 10, 15 years. Uh, and uh, withdrawal strategies are a little bit different, right? You, you withdraw more, you withdraw less, that will have an impact on your retirement success, right? So there, right there, there's the, uh, there's the big difference between saving for retirement and then withdrawing money in retirement. Saving for retirement is relatively simple. Withdrawing money is a little bit more complicated. So this is, the, by the way, the talk I gave last year at the Camp Fi in Virginia. And I, I could have just recycled it here, and, uh, but then Lee and Jess, they were there, and uh, so I had to come up with something brand new. So this is, uh, thanks a lot. So, <laughs> but uh, uh, anyways. So uh, when I do my withdrawals, here, it has, now has 32 parts and has a lot of mathematical bells and whistles. And people sometimes ask me, oh, come, come on, cousin, we appreciate all the work you do, but I mean, totally stressing out, right? I mean, there's so much uncertainty. Why don't you just wing it, right? Uh, so, so why stress out about the math? I mean, what do you do, 3% or 4% or 5%? I mean, that's just, it's just a percent more or less, right? Who cares? Uh, there's so much uncertainty. Uh, or, or with so much uncertainty, it's silly to pin down a withdrawal rate to three significant digits. Uh, that's, that's, another, uh, that's another complaint I sometimes hear. And uh, so my response is, yeah, I mean, sure, I mean, if you want to wing it, uh, go for it. But I want to give you three reasons that, uh, that I think are... Uh, uh, pushed me into going more the mathematical route and not the, and not the winging it. Uh, by the way, I'm winging it in, in many other aspects. Right? People ask me, well, are you, are you going to get bored in retirement? I say, probably not. I'll, I'll just wing that part, but I don't want to wing the math part. And uh, so the it's, 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 question is, what are your priorities? Right? So, so first of all, I think it's mathematically sound. Uh, and uh, so you might notice that there's actually a straw man argument when, when people point out these, these criticisms because uh, I never claimed that by doing the math right that I can eliminate any of the uncertainty. I cannot eliminate market uncertainty, right? The stock bond returns are very volatile every month, every year, every decade. Uh, I can't uh, I can't eliminate the uncertainty that while well, what the future holds might be completely different from what the past market returns were, so I call that model uncertainty. Uh, I can't undo an, any policy uncertainty. I don't know if taxes are going to be higher or lower in the future, what taxes will be higher, what taxes will be. Mostly they will be higher, but I don't know where exactly. I don't know what they'll do to Social Security. Uh, I don't know how my personal uncertainties are going to work out, my, my budget over life. Uh, so the health expenditures, long-term care, and kids, and so how much money are we going to spend on our kid over time? Uh, so all I'm saying is that uh, if we add that additional layer on top of that sloppiness, winging it, we're just going to compound that uncertainty. So it's not a valid argument to say that because there's uncertainty, we can just wing it. For me, it's actually the other way around. So the analogy would, that, would be that, so imagine you're a medical professional and uh, you have to give some medication to a patient and you look it up in some table and it says 65 milligrams for this patient. And then the, and then the doctor or nurse practitioner or nurse says, uh, uh, who, who cares, 50 milligrams, 65, 75, there's high uncertainty anyways if this patient survives. So let's just, uh, <laughs> let's just wing it, right? I'm just going to look at, uh, okay, that looks like 65 and then goes in the patient. No, but if there is uncertainty already about the patient and we don't want to add more uncertainty by, by having the additional uncertainty and the dosage. All right, so and this, is, this, is where, this is where I'm coming from. And anyway, so if you look at my blog and my, my safe withdrawal rate series, you, you'll find a lot of material on market uncertainty, right? So this is something that... that when I was working in finance, this is obviously something that I studied very, very much. And again, I mean, just in, in case this wasn't totally obvious, I never claimed that if I pin down my safe withdrawal rate down to 4.000% or 3.25%, 
uh, that I get rid of any of the market uncertainty. In fact, this is what the, the entire blog, this is what the entire series is about, that if you have, say, a 4% withdrawal rate and you start with a, with a portfolio uh, of, say, $1 or $1 million or $100,000 or whatever you want to scale this to, uh, after 10 years, you have some huge uncertainty about where that net worth will be at that time, right? And that uncertainty, unfortunately, gets worse and worse the longer you roll forward your time. And uh, so, for example, after 20 years, you already have a few uh, cohorts in historical simulations where you almost depleted it down to anywhere between zero to $250,000 if you started with a million. But then on the, on the upside, you always have some very, very well uh, uh, turned out uh, cohorts where you, have, uh, you, you end up with more than six times than, than what you started with, right? Uh, so 30 years, now you start seeing the first failures. It's relatively low percentage, 1.7% uh, in historical simulations. Uh, but you also have very high probability that you'll end up with less than what you started with. So, which is okay if you have a 30-year retirement. If you have a 60-year retirement, you probably don't want to deplete very much over the first 30 years because then you could say, well, now I'll do another 30-year window. And uh, if you if after 30 years you have significantly less than what you started with, then it turns out that your second half of your retirement might be a little bit leaner. Uh, and there's, a, there's actually a pretty high probability for that. Uh, it's over 30% already. And then if we, if we expand this to more years, so by the way, so I'm taking the same 30 years and I'm just uh, uh, shifting out that x-axis. And uh, so I go all the way to 20 and you'll see why. So if after 40 years, after 50 years, after 60 years, how that uncertainty spreads out. And again, I'm not saying that by doing your withdrawal analysis properly that I can eliminate any of that uncertainty. That uncertainty is there all the time. And uh, I'm just saying that we don't want to add any more uncertainty to this because this is already what we're dealing with. And so that's why I don't want to be sloppy. This is why I want, why I want to have some precision in my, uh, in my withdrawal, in my budgets, in my withdrawal strategies, uh, because I don't need any more uncertainty than that. Uh, so here's another nice chart. So again, I take that chart uh, with a 4% withdrawal rate, and uh, this is after 30 years, and I look at, well, 3% versus 4% versus 5%, what difference does that make? It makes a huge difference, right? And uh, so this is what I'm saying. This is the uncertainty that you get if you pin down your budget really tight and really narrow. And uh, uh, so this is if you do it at 3%, this is if you do it at, at, at 5%. So with the 4% rate, you already have some failures. You will never have a failure with a 3% withdrawal rate. You even have almost no chance of even ending up with less after 30 years with a 3% rate. So this is why I, I always say, well, 3% is probably so conservative. Um, you probably have to be, even without any supplemental income, you want to have a little bit more than 3%. Uh, but then you get to 4% and that already gets a little bit scary, right? You have some uh, failures, you have some uh, cohorts that ended up with significantly less, with, half than, with less than half their, their initial capital. Yeah, and that might be a problem for, for long-term retirees like us. And then with a 5% rate, uh, boom, you have a 20% failure rate after after 30 years. So that's probably not the, not the wise uh, path to go if you have a very long retirement. Uh, and, but still, funny thing is, if you look up in the internet, I mean, Trinity study is the most widely cited uh, study on, on withdrawal strategies. They, they all go in 3% to 4% to 5% steps. And that's, that's, that's mind blowing to me that, uh, that uh, they go in such uh, big steps from three to four to five. So here's what I do. So if you go to, uh, I have a Google sheet where you can do your own personalized safe withdrawal analysis. And I would suggest that you go at least in quarter percentage steps in your safe withdrawal rate. And the reason is this. So for example, um, if, you're, if we are in a, in a region where we are right now, we have a CAPE ratio that's a little bit elevated. So going from 3.5%, to 3.75%, I go from a 2% failure rate to an 18% failure rate. So I, I, I would almost suggest that going in quarter percent steps, that's also a little bit too coarse for, for me, but I don't want to do too much of a data dump in that table. And, and if, you, if you ever download this sheet, you, you, can, you can adjust this and, uh, and do whatever steps you want there. Uh, but I mean, this is, this is why I'm worried about 3.5 versus 3.75, because there's this huge, uh, this, this huge sensitivity of final outcomes uh, 
when, uh, when you change your withdrawal rate in, in terms of the, the, the final outcomes. And, uh, and again, the reason is we know all, all about the story that very small amounts, if saved and, and compounded over many years, can make a big difference. And this is, in some way, this is hurting us here, right? So you do your withdrawal rate a little bit too high. Uh, you go from a failure rate of almost nothing, of nothing, to almost nothing, to 2% to 17%. And uh, so that, that's definitely, I mean, I would probably be okay with this. I would not be okay with this. Uh, and, uh, and so I, I was thinking about, so why, why, do people, uh, why do people get so upset about, well, we can't do the safe withdrawal rate with uh, significant digits after the, after the decimal point? And I think that people get confused about percentages, right? Because the percentage of the withdrawal rate is the percentage of your initial assets, right? So if I go from a 3% to a 4% to a 5% rate, yeah, it looks like it's only a 1% difference, right? And what, what are really the things in our finance that we can pin down to the closest 1%? I, mean, you could, I couldn't even pin down my net worth down to the closest 1%. So, so, uh, and, uh, but, but we're talking about here, so imagine you have a $1.5 million initial net worth. So the withdrawal amounts, if you go in 1% steps, they would go from 45 to 60 to 75,000. If you cannot pin down your retirement budget to the closest $15,000, that's, that's probably not a good sign, right? The, it's just a, and, I'm not, and I'm not talking about any particular year, right? Because you could have some big expenditure shocks. We're, we're talking about this is the average over your entire retirement, right? Uh, because going from 45 to 60, that's a 33% step. From 60 to 75, that's a 25% step. So that's why I, I, I'm always, uh, it, I'm always uh, getting upset when people say, well, why do you even pin down a safe withdrawal rate to, the, to digits after the decimal point? I mean, this is the reason, right? It's, this is way too coarse for my uh, taste. I, I, as, as I said, I would pin it down probably to the closest 0.25%. Because then going from 52.5 to 56 to 50, so now we're going to go in, in terms of my annual budgets, in steps of 37.50, that's still a 7% or a 6% step uh, in my total budget. Again, people say, well, what, what difference does a quarter percent point make? It's not a quarter percent point, right? These are the changes in your budget if you make a quarter percent change in your withdrawal rate. Uh, I would probably even go to the closest 0.1%. I mean, I, most people who do their budgeting and do the budgeting right, uh, they, they'll try to probably pin it down to the, to the closest uh, $1,500, maybe 0.05%, that's a little bit, that's a little bit overkill. Uh, and then 0.01%. Again, I mean, when I, when I uh, print out safe withdrawal rates and I say, well, it's 3.28%, yeah, I mean, I can calculate this would have been the fail-safe in historical simulations. Yeah, I mean, whether it's 3.28 or 3.25 or 3.35, it doesn't really matter that much at, at that level. But uh, uh, so, so when, when, when I worked in, in, in finance, and I did a lot of data science. I mean, I, I also did, we, we displayed all numbers. At, at, when we calculated numbers, we did the calculation at 16 significant digits, right? Of course, then in the end, when you display it, that's when you can do the rounding. Right? And then you round it to whatever precision uh, you're comfortable with. But I always had this philosophy that if you do any kind of data science, you keep everything as precise as possible all the way until the end of the process. And then at the end of the process, you do the rounding, not along the way. Because if you do rounding here and rounding there and rounding there and rounding there, that's basically the winging it part. Uh, that's when mistakes and, uh, and uncertainties would, uh, would uh, compound over time. Anyways, I'll have some more on that, uh, uh, on, on simulation results and stuff like that. Uh, but I just wanted to give you the, the two other reasons. So first of all, the other reason why you want to do your analysis right is, uh, so people always claim that I'm the big enemy of the 4% rule. And I've actually given just as many uh, people advice where I push them to a higher than 4% rate than a lower than 4% rate. So prime examples would be people who are retiring in their, in their late 40s, early 50s, maybe even mid 50s. Uh, they're expecting company pensions soon, uh, very generous social security benefits. Uh, and then, yeah, they may still have a longer than usual retirement horizon, but the retirement horizon is 
basically a multi-stage process. So you, you withdraw a little bit more than 4% during the first 10, 15 years, and then all of your other benefits kick in. And then uh, if you are comfortable and you think that uh, you're going to reduce your portfolio withdrawals one for one, once Social Security kicks in, uh, then yeah, I mean, I would be all for it. I mean, you should probably have higher than 4% withdrawal rate. And I've seen lots of cases and case studies where I pushed for 5%, even 6% withdrawal rates. Uh, so you could even get there faster. So again, if you're sloppy and you say, well, I heard about the 4% rule, and then there are people in their 50s, and they're still targeting for a 4% rule, I say, well, yeah, I mean, see, that this sloppiness is going to cost you by working too long and not by, by running out of money. So the, the risk also goes both ways. Uh, and then also, I think you'll retire with more confidence and, uh, and a more relaxed retirement. So this, this is definitely what pushed me into writing my blog and writing my, my safe withdrawal rate series. Uh, I, I don't think I would have been comfortable. I would still be working if I hadn't done my analysis right. Because, I mean, yeah, 4% rule and Trinity study is all really nice, but it didn't really satisfy my... My, my need for, for robustness and, and rigor. Uh, and uh, so I, uh, d after doing my analysis, I had the comfort to retire. Uh, both at that time, I was comfortable doing it, and then also convincing my, my wife that this is all sound. Uh, and then also while in retirement, right, I mean, la late last year, I think the, the S&P dropped by almost 20%, and uh, you, you hear some ramblings going on in the Facebook groups and on Shoesify, and everybody's getting panicked. I said, well, I, I slept well, because I, <laughs> I mean, if, so 20% is not going to wipe out my portfolio, because my portfolio would have survived another Great Depression. So, uh, and uh, again, so you do a little bit more rigorous and careful analysis that also makes you sleep better uh, if, uh, if, uh, if you have that market volatility. And, uh, so I have some more simulation results. And uh, so the first thing that I always hear, and, uh, and this is actually the first time I did the analysis on this properly, I, I always had that intuition uh, that this is, how, this is gonna work out, but unfortunately it, it does. Uh, so because people always say, well, all of your withdrawal analysis, it's, I'm gonna, just gonna ignore that because my personal expenses are never gonna be constant, right? And what a lot of people assume in the, uh, in, the, in the Trinity study, and then on, also on my, uh, in, my, uh, uh, in my simulations, uh, is that there's, there's a level amount of, say, $40,000 if you have a million dollar portfolio, or $60,000 if you have a $1.5 million portfolio. Um, and, uh, but there's obviously fluctuations. And as a, who, who's a homeowner around here? Right, so, you, so sometimes nothing breaks at all. You, there's no maintenance. Uh, and sometimes everything breaks at the same time. So you have some volatility just from that. So there's a durable goods uh, like a car or uh, it's probably the car is the most prominent. So you need car repairs some, every once in a while. Every 10, 15 years, you replace your car. Uh, health expenditures, especially if you have a high deductible plan. So in general, crap happens, and, and if it rains, it pours. So, uh, and so my question was, well, how much does it matter if we set basically one baseline budget, and then we have fluctuations around that, okay? And when I, may, when I mean by baseline budget, I mean the average of these fluctuations. I'm not saying the lower bound, and then every once in a while you spend more, and if you're lucky, you spend only your budget, and uh, so that's not, that's not how I'm talking about it. I'm talking about you, you've already done your budget, say, for your housing expenses, and you take into account uh, that sometimes you repair nothing, and sometimes you repair the roof and the, and the water heater. So what I wanted to do is, because I had these charts with what is the final outcome after this many years of withdrawals at a certain rate, what happens if I compare this flat withdrawal profile with one that has some fluctuations in it, okay? And I take uh, a $1.5 million portfolio, I take the fixed withdrawal path, so $60,000 every year. That's adjusted for inflation every year, uh, and then the 4% then the rule. And then I do a variable spending path where, so in the simulations I assume that in the first year there's a coin flip. You either start with the high amount or with the low amount, so either $72,000 or $48,000, and then you go back and forth between the high and the low amount. That's actually pretty substantial fluctuations, right? Because from the high to the low, your spending drops by 33%, and then from the low to the high, it increases by 50%. 
Um, I, this is probably higher than my volatility in spending, and uh, I mean, I, I, I'll be if, if you if you want to weigh in at the end, if you think this is this is too much or too little, let me know. Um, so, and I I wonder how much of a difference does this make after 30 years, right? And uh, so that argument is kind of a red herring because I, I had to check and double check the numbers, but they actually turn out to be pretty much exactly the same, whether you have the variable spending path or the fixed spending path. And the reason is, uh, so people who say that, uh, that this matters a lot, they, they apparently don't quite understand what sequence of return risk means, right? So sequence of return risk means you liquidate assets when the market is down, right? But the market down move is much longer than one year. Right? It's at least two years. In, in many cases, it's five years, maybe up to 10 years if you look at, uh, at real uh, equity uh, uh, path. And uh, whether in the first year I withdraw 72 and in the second year 48 or 48 and 72 or 60 and 60, if the market is down for sequence of return risk, it doesn't really matter whether you do the high withdrawal first or the low withdrawal first. So, and uh, if the if the frequency of your, of your spending patterns is, uh, is, is a higher frequency than, than this, the, these long market cycles, then it shouldn't really matter that much. I did some other calculations. In order to even see some, some significant changes in the, uh, say, in the failure rate, so it was 1.67% if you have a fixed withdrawal, and then the alternating patterns had a 1.7%. So everything, the, the standard deviation goes from 1.5317 to 1.5318. Again, uh, I'm, I'm not married to, to, to going to four digits. I, I just added the fourth digit here to, to see where, where's the difference anyways. And you have to go all the way to the fourth digit to see even a difference after that many years. And uh, so, yeah, and again, as I said, you do the precision as, as high as possible, and then in the end you round it, and then you conclude that this is pretty much all the same. So when somebody tells me that, uh, yeah, but my spending is, uh, uh, is really volatile, uh, and we should just ignore your safe withdrawal rate series, I just say that's a, that's a red herring. That, that doesn't really matter. So the fluctuations around the mean are just totally irrelevant. Uh, now, the types of spending uncertainty that we should worry about uh, are these. So I'm much more concerned uh, about uh, basically expenditures having upside potential, right? A zero mean doesn't matter so much, but something with a positive mean. So something like, uh, so imagine that sometime into my retirement, my expenses go up by 50%. Or you, you, said, you said any number, I just start with 50%. So I say this could be a nursing home scenario where, uh, so you start say with a, with a $60,000 budget, uh, you have to spend a lot of money on the nursing home, but you also save a little bit on other expenses, you travel less, uh, but you, still your expenditures go up to $90,000 a year. But the nice thing is this starts in year 35 in your retirement. So this would be in-home care or nursing home or health expense shocks, uh, something like that. Uh, second scenario is the, first as, is the same as the first one, but also your life expectancy goes down by one year. So I, I looked at a 50-year at a retirement horizon. So you, you die five years younger. So instead of, uh, instead of uh, um, uh, say you start at age 45 and at age 80, age 80 you do the uh, expenditure shock. Uh, but then you also die five years younger. Uh, and uh, which is, which, I mean, actually for nursing home care, this is, this is what really got me about this Susie Orman episode on the, on the podcast where she says, well, you have to spend $350,000 every year in the nursing home. And first of all, it doesn't start right away, right? I mean, I, I quit my job last year and uh, I didn't go to the nursing home the same <laughs> afternoon. Uh, I first went home, and I hope I go home and travel for another 45 years, and then I go to the nursing home. <laughs> and then, and then, uh, not just that, but once you are in the nursing home, say you're 80 years old, usually the stay is not your entire rest of your life expense. You, you probably have a lower life expectancy at that point. So, uh, anyways, uh, the, the next scenario is this slow spending creep, right? So imagine you start with the really, really bare bones budget in retirement, and uh, you don't even notice it. Every year, your expenditures go up, uh, inflation plus 1%. And it doesn't really matter year after year. It's like cooking a frog, right? So the temperature goes up very slowly. The frog doesn't even notice it. 
Uh, and uh, so it's the same with your expenditure sometimes in, in retirement, right? You start really low and it just creeps up by 1% every year. Uh, how much of a difference would that make? Right? So that's, uh, that's one. Or the other one would be you start with a really, really bare bones budget and then two years into retirement you realize, okay, I, I can't do this anymore. Uh, either you can't do it anymore because, say, initially you started with very low withdrawals because you had a side hustle or a blog and then you get sick and tired of writing for the blog and then you shut that down and so that income goes away. Uh, or you had some other side hustle, you don't want to do that anymore. Or just your spending goes up, right? You, you set your budget to, yeah, I mean, the last two years, nothing happened to my house, and this is my budget now, but, uh, and then it, it goes okay for another two years in retirement, but then, boom, everything starts breaking at the same time. And you have a 25% extra uh, withdrawal every year because, you're, because your budget went up by that much. And uh, so what I found is that so this is the baseline. Uh, these are the four scenarios. So what are the failure rates over, over 50 years? So what I found is that it's actually quite amazing that that nursing home scenario doesn't make that much of an impact on my failure rates in my, in my safe withdrawal analysis. So it's probably something that it's on my radar screen for the future. Well, there's this, this the problem with nursing home care. Uh, but especially when you consider that also your life expectancy goes down, uh, it's almost a wash in terms of the failure rates. Uh, so these are, these are uh, all failure rates. Uh, this is with the CAPE greater than 20 as we are today, so slightly expensive equity valuations. And yeah, I mean, it makes a difference, but it doesn't make a huge difference, right? And, uh, but what I would worry about uh, are these scenarios where you get the, the spending volatility, but the volatility is always on the upside. So it goes up. Uh, by 1% over inflation every year, or you get that 25% shock uh, after two years. Uh, and now we go from a 3% failure rate to a 40% failure rate. So that is, that is the kind of spending uncertainty that I really worry about. So the volatility around your, around your baseline spending path, uh, that is totally irrelevant. Uh, spending shocks very late in retirement. Again, it's not really impacted by, say, uh, by, uh, by sequence risk. Uh, but, but this definitely is, and uh, so I would definitely worry about that. Um, there's one other thing I wanted to show uh, before I wrap this up. Uh, I actually lied to you in the beginning about one thing. I said I can't reduce uncertainty, the market uncertainty, right? That's just there. Uh, there is one way to reduce market uncertainty, but unfortunately it's not in a way that everybody will like, uh, and it's in the following way. So if I look at these, uh, these are the outcomes after 30 year retirement with a 4% withdrawal rate. Uh, if I look at what was the CAPE ratio, which is, a, which is a, um, a measure of how expensive equities are at the beginning of retirement, uh, then uh, uh, it turns out that all the failures occur when the CAPE ratio is high and all these spectacular returns where you start with a million dollars and you end up with five or six million dollars, they only occur when the CAPE ratio is really low. And uh, so, I mean, that is obviously a way to reduce uncertainty in retirement because this one had a standard deviation of 1.5. And then if I look at the the partial charts are conditional on what was your initial equity valuation. Yeah, it turns out that the standard deviation is only half if I condition on high equity valuations, but unfortunately the mean is also much lower. So, so there's a way to reduce uncertainty, but it also reduce, it actually it reduces the uncertainty on the upside, and it leaves all the really crummy outcomes where you almost run out of money. Uh, after 30 years retirement, that's all left in there. So the, the uncertainty is reduced, but not in a good way. Um, anyway, so wrapping up, so uncertainty is actually the reason why we should be precise uh, about withdrawal strategy. So, so market uncertainty, I, can, I can't avoid it, but uh, I can condition on equity valuations. And then unfortunately, I, I would actually, that would entice me to, to be a little bit more conservative, uh, use lower uh, initial safe withdrawal rates. Uh, so for the personal uncertainty, uh, I can't go through every single scenario, every single, uh, every single, every single thing that can go wrong with your personal budget. But uh, so what I I would argue is what you don't have to sweat is the normal variations about your expenditure. So if you do your budget right and you factor into your budget, not the not the good years of home ownership, but the average year of home ownership, uh, you should be fine. 
Uh, slightly concerning is that nursing home scenario, but it's too far in the future. So it's probably not going to have a big impact on my uh, on my uh, safe withdrawal rates. Uh, but what's very important is you want to get your initial budget right uh, and uh, uh, so watch that retirement expense creep. Uh, and uh, so, but then also factor in future additional cash flow. So a lot of people can raise their safe withdrawal rate really substantially if they take into account their social security and, uh, uh, and pensions and, and the like. And, uh, uh, and, and then what, what always gets me, people say, well, I'll just do a side hustle in retirement, which is fine, but I would never assume that I do it my entire life, right? People say sometimes, yeah, I do a $10,000 side hustle, multiply that by 25, that is worth $250,000 in portfolio value today. And I say, no, it's not, because I'm 45. I'm not going to be a Starbucks barista at age 62. Well, maybe if I have to, I will, but uh, I... <laughs> I don't want it, so I would actually do it the other way around. I will say, I'll take $250,000 from my portfolio and I designate that into, hey, I can hire somebody for $10,000 every year to do stuff for me, I'll mow my lawn and, uh, and clean out the gutters and stuff like that. So I would actually do it the other way around. Uh, but, so, any kind of side hustle income, I would never consider that as, a, whether it's a blog or, or some other side hustle, I would never consider that a permanent income because I'll not be doing it, uh, certainly not in 30 years anymore. And uh, I didn't really talk too much about the other two elements of model uncertainty. People always say past returns are no guarantee for future results. And actually that disclaimer applies here too. But it actually would entice me to be a little bit more conservative. Right, because uh, I mean, so because sometimes you hear people, well, yeah, the Trinity study said it's four percent, yeah, but past returns are no guarantee for future results, so we should actually do five percent, and that's actually the. I used to work in finance, and we had to put all of this legal language in the disclaimers, and believe me, we never said, oh, past results are no guarantee, and you could actually, you should actually budget better returns in the future than in the past, and we would have gotten sued like crazy, right? <laughs> so that this. This disclaimer always means you should be more conservative, not less conservative, right? And uh, so anyways, uh, policy uncertainty, if you're really young uh, and you look at your social security statement, maybe give that a little bit of a haircut, right? Because uh, there could be some benefit cuts. I think if you're 55 and older, you have nothing to fear. I don't think politicians would touch that. Uh, and then also for tax policy, I wouldn't put all my eggs in one basket. Uh, taxes will have to rise somewhere, somehow. And uh, not sure if it's going to be, uh, not sure if it's going to be ordinary income tax, right? Where I'll be taxed at my, my traditional IRAs and uh, 401ks, uh, or whether it's uh, capital gains and dividends, and they're going to hit me here in the taxable accounts. So I would like to spread it out into, into all the different buckets and not, and not do. But maybe they'll find a way to do Roth IRA taxation. I mean, who knows? If, if too many people generate all this tax-free income in retirement, and they say, well, not, well now we're going to do a national sales tax. You're going to consume it somewhere, or we're going to get you that way. So anyway, so uh, I, will, I would uh, hedge my bets and uh, keep all my options open there. Okay, uh, that's it for, for me. Looking forward to questions and comments.